Hey everyone, I'm Charles Judd, and welcome to this video continuing to look at the 1.1e Blueprint section for Spanning Tree Protocol. I'll explore the topics of switch priority and port priority, as well as path cost and Spanning Tree Protocol timers in this video. These concepts are absolutely crucial to understanding how Spanning Tree works, and I would argue that this is very important even outside of the CCIE exam. It's easy to just take spanning tree for granted because it usually works. However, in those cases where it doesn't, we need a really solid understanding of what's going on in the background. If you're a network admin or engineer at any level, I believe this is one of those must know concepts. So let's dive in and take a look. The first topic we're going to explore is switch priority. We've previously looked at this just a bit in regard to manually changing our switch priority in order to influence our root bridge in spanning tree. So you likely have a general understanding of how this works, but we do need to understand a bit more about how this root bridge election takes place. When we're using spanning tree, it's mandatory that each switch running STP has a unique bridge ID or BID. In the original 802.1D spanning tree standard, the BID is an eight byte value consisting of a two byte bridge priority value, which you may remember defaults to the priority value of 32,768. And we have a six byte MAC address field, which is the MAC address of the switch. Now, this format wasn't a problem until we came across things like PVST and Rapid PVST. And remember, those create a separate spanning tree instance for each VLAN. So if we have 50 VLANs, that means we have 50 instances of spanning tree running with 50 unique BIDs required. So how did that work? Well, in older switches, each VLAN that was created was assigned a new MAC address for each STP instance. So we had a bank of available MAC addresses so that the BIDs could remain unique. This became just simply too ineffective and it was consuming too many MAC addresses and it was just inefficient all around. So IEEE came up with the solution of adding a system ID extension. That was a way that we could carry the VLAN ID or the VID, which added another field that would help us to create more unique values for our bridge ID. So here you see, we still have the bridge priority consisting of four bits. We still have the MAC address as well, consisting of six bytes or 48 bits. And between those, we have an additional field for the system ID extension, 12 bits, which carry the VLAN ID or the VID. So the system ID extension essentially indicates which VLAN this bridge ID is for. By default, our newer switches use the extended bridge ID as we see here that will contain the VLAN ID inside. The switch with the lowest bridge ID will of course be elected as our root bridge. The selection process starts with each switch constructing bridge protocol data unit frames or BPDU frames. These frames contain information about spanning tree protocol. And so originally each switch would construct a hello BPDU advertising itself as the root bridge ID. However, once the switch receives a BPDU that has a lower bridge ID, it recognizes that it is not in fact the root bridge. So it will then alter its own hello BPDU. Instead of placing its own bridge ID in the root bridge ID value, it's going to replace that with the lower value that it received from a neighboring switch. And that process would continue until every switch would be informed of the other neighboring devices and until they all agree upon who is going to be the root bridge. If all of the devices have the same priority value, which they do by default on Cisco switches, that value being 32768, then the lowest MAC address is going to be the tiebreaker. So essentially the root bridge selection in that case is going to be left completely up to chance. And you might have a switch that isn't exactly the optimal choice that's going to be acting as the root bridge. That's a case where we would want to manually alter the root bridge, maybe by changing the priority in some way. And we've looked at how we can manipulate that already in a previous video. 
If we take a look at this in a live environment, you can see here that I have a couple of switches connected together with redundant links. On switch one, if I say show span, notice that we'll see our bridge ID priority value listed here as 32769. You might notice that is one higher than the default value. Why is that? Well, we're using the system ID extension by default because I'm using a newer switch with a newer iOS. And we can see that listed here actually. The system ID extension is actually one. So we have the priority default value of 32768 plus the system ID extension of one added together to create our priority 32769. So this is the bridge ID for VLAN one. We can also see the address listed here, which is of course the Mac address of the switch. Let's go over to switch two and let's do the same. Let's say show span. And we can see that this switch we're told is the root bridge. We can see that our bridge priority is the same 32769 because we've added the system ID extension. Of course, our Mac address is different and our Mac address on switch two is lower. So this switch has been elected the root bridge. And again, we've previously explored manipulating our priority value to influence our root bridge. But one of the things we haven't looked at manipulating just yet is our port priority, which will influence root port selection. There are many design considerations that might require you to change the default root port selection, such as the actual topology itself, maybe the hardware platform and many other considerations. So as we begin this discussion, let me first point out that here on switch two, we know that this is the root bridge. We're explicitly told that here. So we would expect to see all of our interfaces in the designated role for forwarding. And in fact, we do see that here. We're only using gig zero slash zero and zero slash one, so we could ignore our other two interfaces for now. But we know that on this root bridge, we should see everything as the designated port. Now, every non root bridge is going to elect a root port and the root port is going to be the port closest to the root bridge in terms of path cost. How will that be determined in this case? We actually have two identical links between our switches. The first criteria would be the lowest cost to get to our root bridge. If we let's actually go to switch one and let's say show span detail. And if we look at our two ports that are in use, gig zero slash zero, and gig zero slash one, you'll notice that they're both listed with a port path cost of four. Both of those interfaces have the exact same cost. Four is the default cost for a one gig link. So we actually have a tie in the cost. Just to round out the path cost here, this is a chart for the default path cost values for our different bandwidth links. We see that 10 gig links are going to have a cost of two, one gig links have a cost of four, 100 meg links have a cost of 19, and 10 meg links have a cost of 100. So the traffic path to the root bridge, if we have multiple paths, the switch is going to add up the cost for all of those links, and the lowest cost is going to be designated as the root port. That's a concept that you should probably already be familiar with from CCNA or CCNP studies. So if we jump back to our topology, again, we have a tie in that cost. So what happens now? Well, the next criteria would be the lowest sending bridge ID. Since all of our connections go over to switch two, we have two identical links here. Those are also going to be the same. For gig zero slash zero, we see the designated bridge priority 32769. And we see exactly the same thing for gig zero slash one. Again, we know those are connected to the same switch, so not a surprise there. The next criteria is going to be the lowest port ID of the sender. If we look at the designated port ID, first for gig zero slash zero, we see the value is 128.1. And for gig zero slash one, the designated port ID is 128.1. Dot two. So we would expect gig zero slash zero to be the root port. 
Let's actually say show span once again. And we can see that in fact, gig zero slash zero is our root port in the forwarding state. And we see gig zero slash one being an alternate port in the blocking state. Besides that, we can also see our local port priority values here. We see 128.1 through 128.4. Now I do want to say not to get these confused. These are our local values, but we base our root port on the lowest sender priority values. And in order to see the sending port priority values, we can use that show span detail command again. And this is going to show us the port values on the sending side, the designated port ID. So it's very important that we remember not to get confused and look at those local values. The value we see here consists of a four bit priority value, which by default is 128. And then we have a 12 bit interface ID added to that. So if we look at gig zero slash zero, for instance, and we see the port ID of 128.1, we have the default priority value of 128, plus we have the interface ID value of one. And the interface ID value is one because this is the first interface on my switch. So those are added together to give a total of 128.1. For the second interface, we see a value of two added to the default value 128 for 128.2. Let's jump over to switch two and let's talk about how we can actually influence the port priority value. Remember, we need to change the priority on the root bridge in order to affect the root port on our other switch. So let's go under interface gig zero slash zero. This is currently the interface ID that we see from switch one as having the lowest ID. So we can influence that by saying spanning hyphen tree port hyphen priority. And if we look at contextual help, you see that we can set this as a value from zero to 240 in increments of 16. So in this case, just to see what happens, I'm going to raise this default priority value by 16 from 128 to 144. Now this will take just a few moments to reconverge. So let's jump over to switch one and let's again say show span. And now you'll notice that we're still in the learning state at the moment because this does take a little bit of time to reconverge, but we have a change that's happened. We now see gig zero slash one listed as our root port and gig zero slash zero is an alternate port in the blocking state. Notice again, our local values have not changed. All of these local priority values, they're exactly the same. So again, don't confuse those with the sending port priority values. Let's look at those by saying again, show span detail. And if we look at gig zero slash zero, you'll see that our designated port ID has in fact changed from 128.1 to 144.1. Our interface ID has been added to the priority value of 144 that we indicated. So now the lowest designated port ID is on gig zero slash one. And that's why we see gig zero slash one now being the root port on this switch. So to wrap things up here, let's discuss our timers. Let's go on our root bridge. I'm going to go under global configuration mode and I'm going to say spanning hyphen tree VLAN one, and I'm going to look at contextual help. We've already looked at the root and priority options. So we could configure this as a root primary or secondary. We can manually change the bridge priority to alter our spanning tree topology if we want to do that. So here we want to talk about these last three options, which are our timers. If we look at our hello time options, this is the time between each BPDU that gets sent out. And by default, that timer is set to two seconds. We see that we can change that to a value between one and 10 seconds. The next thing we have is our forward time also referred to as our forward delay. And this is the time that we spend in the listening and learning state. By default, that is 15 seconds. 
you see that we can set that to any value between four and 30 seconds. And finally, we have the max age timer and the max age timer controls the maximum length of time that passes before a port saves the BPDU information that it's receiving. We know that in a stable spanning tree topology, only root ports and designated ports are going to receive BPDUs. If a BPDU is received that contains better information than what the port already knows about, then the max age timer is reset and the information is updated. Now, I'll point out again, as I've mentioned in a previous video, this is something we rarely see come into play with our modern iterations of spanning tree because rapid spanning tree uses a keep alive mechanism instead. But regardless, we can adjust this from the default value of 20 seconds. And we see we're able to do that ranging from six to 40 seconds. I'll also point out that we would only change these timers on the root bridge. And that's because the root bridge would propagate our new timer values throughout the spanning tree topology with BPDU configuration messages. So that wraps up a look at switch and port priority values, path cost, and spanning tree timers. I hope you found this content useful and I wanna thank you sincerely for watching.